Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Dorr. I am ISA's Director of Professional Development. Um, today I'm here with Professor Thomas Beersticker. He is, take, uh, he is taking the lead on today's GIRS event office hours. So this event is for our members and anybody who is interested in learning more about the United Nations and and questions on how to work with them and research them. So I'm going to turn it over to Thomas and have him introduce himself and, and just uh, share a little bit about his career trajectory and how he ended up um, with his current role with the United Nations. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sarah, for that uh, introduction. I don't, uh, it's hard to know where to begin. Um, maybe I should back up a bit. Um, early in my career, I studied uh, international financial organizations and institutions. So I was looking at international organizations uh, at a fairly early stage. That was back in the 1990s. I was particularly interested in the consequences of World Bank and IMF uh, programs, particularly uh, structural adjustment and, and uh, conditional support. Um, but I had, um, I initially started my career teaching at Yale University, then I taught at the University of Southern California. While I was at Brown University, which I joined in 1992, I became the director of the Watson Institute for International Studies uh, two years after I arrived. And um, it was in that role that I, I guess, had my introduction from some of my colleagues. I sometimes mentioned that uh, one's own research trajectory, of course, is driven in part by events in the world and uh, engagement with the scholarly literature and, and actually attending many decades of meetings of, of the ISA over the course of my career. Um, but sometimes the institution also shapes one's agenda. And um, when I arrived at, at Brown, I, at, when I became the director of the Watson Institute. I uh, inherited an associate director who had worked with the previous director named Tom Weiss, a former president of the ISA. Uh, and Tom at the time was extremely involved in uh, work research on humanitarian intervention and humanitarian action. So in a way, I was sort of brought in, I can blame Tom Weiss for my introduction uh, to the UN uh, and, and activities, because at the time, uh, the Watson Institute and Brown hosted the Academic Council on the UN System, which Tom was the executive director of at that point in time. And so Indirectly, I started becoming involved in some of the summer institution programs uh, that, that were associated with, with, uh, with Tom's programs. But my current involvement, and, and uh, just to say where I just came from, I was just on a webinar um, basically giving an overview of UN sanctions over the last three decades uh, of, of developments on UN sanctions for the ambassadors of the incoming five members of the UN Security Council. Uh, so I was literally virtually in New York. I'm back in in uh, in our chalet, and I'm, I'm, I never left here. <laughs> I was in our chalet here in, in Switzerland. But um, the way I got involved in in work on sanctions um, again goes back to Tom Weiss, uh, and this time to a collaboration he did with George Lopez and David Courtright, uh, and also with Larry Manier. The four of them wrote a book in the late 1990s about the unacceptably high humanitarian consequences of the comprehensive sanctions against Iraq in the 1990s. Uh, in fact, it's interesting, one of the ambassadors just at the very end asked me uh, for my evaluation of the recent uh, carve-outs that have been written into, into the last several UN Security Council resolutions, carve-outs for humanitarian actors to relieve some of the humanitarian burden of the targeted measures, but that's a different story. So back in the uh, late 90s, um, I periodically would, would have um, board meetings in New York, and I would uh, present, we'd have a board meeting, uh, many of my distinguished board members, uh, including people like Mary Robinson and uh, Sir Crispin Tikal and um, uh, many, many, uh, Richard Holbrook, many, many diplomats, but also uh, leaders, people like Les Gelb from the Council on Foreign Relations, Lee Hamilton, and so on. We would meet periodically and have a business meeting, and then I would provide some academic entertainment. And the academic entertainment was publication of a recent book. So in, in 19, I can't remember, it's 98 or 99, um, Tom, George, David, and, and Larry came out with a book uh, on Iraq called um, Political Gain or Civilian Pain. 
And so we use that book as a feature uh, to have a, a substantive discussion with the board in, after our, our business meeting in New York. Um, and at the end of the meeting, the chairman of the board, the, the late John Berkland, uh, formerly of Dillon Reed Investments in New York, turned to me and said, uh, reminded me of something I'd said in the introduction, and that is that you said at the beginning targeted sanctions. Now, you, know, you said at the beginning that financial sanctions were more effective than trade sanctions. And I said, yes. And basically, I was just reading the literature on the train down from Providence to New York uh, to come up with that conclusion. Uh, but then he said, well, now we've heard about the, the terrible humanitarian impact of comprehensive sanctions. So why not target financial sanctions? And I nodded and said, yes, I think that's a good idea. And then he said, well, why doesn't the Watson Institute begin a project on this subject? And so, well, what am I going to say in front of my board? Uh, but yes, okay, sure. Uh, yeah, it's a great idea. Uh, but it was just at the time that, that Tom Weiss was about to leave for City University of New York. So I thought, great, I've just made a public commitment in front of my board, and I don't have anyone to do this project. Uh, so I had to do it myself. Um, fortunately, I had just hired um, a former Clinton administration, uh, actually, actually Assistant Secretary of Commerce, Sue Eckert, uh, who happened to be Assistant Secretary for Export Controls. And Sue came, she was attending that meeting. She came up afterwards and said, you know, I know a little bit about this subject. And that's when Sue and I decided to begin our collaboration, which we did uh, for a couple of decades, looking at, um, at the development of the instrument of, of targeted sanctions at the UN. So one thing leads to another. <clears throat> uh, as a result of the, of the meeting, I, I teamed up with the Council on Foreign Relations. We organized some meetings in New York to discuss uh, the issue of the financial with people from the financial sector to talk about uh, the idea, the feasibility of targeting financial sanctions at the outset. Uh, the Swiss ambassador uh, to New York at the time, to the UN in New York at the time, mentioned to me at one of the meetings we had at the council that perhaps um, I should attend the interlocking process meetings in, in Switzerland. This was in 1999. And so suddenly I found myself uh, coming here to Switzerland and um, knowing almost nothing about sanctions. I, it was one of these meetings where I went and just, I was a fly in the I was sitting up, I was a fly in the wall, except I was seated next to the head of the Office of Foreign Asset Control from the US Treasury Department, uh, Peter Newcomb. Uh, and so suddenly I was officially part of this US delegation and it was a crash course for me to learn about uh, targeted sanctions. And as I say, one thing leads to another. After the interlocking process, there was the, the Germans organized another process on, on travel bans, aviation bans, um, and uh, arms embargoes. Uh, and then a year later, Sweden organized a series of meetings on the implementation of targeted sanctions. So I gradually became immersed in sort of what, what I would describe as a, a transnational policy network. And what I mean by that is it's a combination, it's a network of people who share expertise on the subject. Uh, and they, they're invited by virtue of that expertise, but it's not as if it's, it's not an advocacy network and it's not a transgovernmental network. So although they're both present in these meetings, it's a network that involves people from governments, from international organizations, from the private sector, uh, both for profit, but also the academic uh, scholars from international law and international relations. And through this process, I gradually developed um, both knowledge, but also quite a lot of uh, quite a large network of people working on the reform of sanctions at the international level. And from the start, my work was was uh, relatively policy engaged, at least for me personally as a scholar, because um, I've always been publishing scholarly books throughout my career. So this was a bit of a departure into the policy domain. Uh, but a couple of years later, a friend at the UN Secretariat said to me, why don't, why don't you go and help us make the case for targeted sanctions? People just don't understand these. Uh, and I said, well, Lorraine, that's a great idea, but um, I don't really know if they're effective. We'd have to really study that. And that then led from this initial policy engagement to uh, the creation of what we called the Targeted Sanctions Consortium. And this was a group of 50 scholars and policy practitioners from around the world who had a knowledge of or interest in, in sanctions uh, from multiple methods. I must say we had everyone from traditional quantitative large end studies, case study people, formal theorists, uh, multiple methods uh, and, and analysts of linguistics. Uh, and we also brought them together with policy practitioners. So we had this mix of scholars and policy practitioners. 
and we developed uh, jointly a research project, uh, and that was a research project uh, that resulted in our 2016 book with Cambridge University Press called Targeted Sanctions, The Impact and Effectiveness of United Nations Action. So throughout the last 20 years, I've been sort of navigating the space between the scholarly analysis of sanctions and the attempts to try to bring the analysis and the results of our work to the policy community more largely. And one innovation, I can't take credit for it, I take responsibility for it, but not credit, uh, was the creation of UN Sanctions app. And so not only have we done the usual scholarly thing, that is publish a book and write articles, uh, but we also created an app. And the app is uh, free, downloadable, it's uh, downloadable on your phone, or it's on you can also go to unsanctionsapp.com and, and uh, access it on the web. Uh, and what this is, is it's an ongoing real-time research project. And interestingly enough, I was just the, the head of Security Council report who was co-chairing the session I just came from, um, asked me to elaborate on the app in front of the ambassadors to let them know that their staff, that, that this information is available to them. Because I said, it's basically a repository of the history of UN targeted sanctions practices. So. Um, as I say, one thing leads to another. The idea for the, creating the app actually came from a Swiss diplomat, and um, she she was the one who said, "Why don't you try to make this this material more accessible to those of us in going to meetings and sitting in a meeting, so we can actually have access to information in real time?" So that's when we we developed. Uh, initially, it was called Sanctions App. Now it's called UN Sanctions App because we don't want to mislead. It's not about all sanctions. Uh, but in any event, that's a long answer to to a bit of a biography of my recent involvements and in how, as I say, one thing leads to another, and including um, I do regular training now with the Security Council Affairs Division uh, for not only new members of the Security Council, but actually for all members. And we've even, in our sanctions training, we've trained four of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. So I sometimes oh, wow. like to say to, to colleagues that uh, it's a bit like playing model UN with the UN, but... Um, that's, uh, that's part of what I'm, I'm engaged in. That being said, I don't want to say this is all I do because I also do work on, uh, on governance, uh, definitions of global governance, a new book coming out called Informal Governance and World Politics. So I keep my hand in the, on the scholarly side as well, but uh, I'm, I'm keeping pretty busy. Sanctions definitely keep me busy. And thanks to Vladimir Putin, we had quite a lot to talk about over the past uh, eight months or so when it comes to sanctions. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, I'm open to... And I'm happy to talk about any number of, of questions. It's office hours. So for office hours, I, I, uh, I took off my tie, which I had for the formal presentation at the UN just a few moments ago. And, uh, and, and I'm happy to, uh, to field any, any comments or questions people might have. So I have two follow-up questions based on what you said. And Mark, um, everybody, this is Mark Boyer. He is the executive director of ISA. Um, I was so excited to introduce Thomas. I, I apologize. I forgot to introduce I forgot Mark. About this guy, Mark Boyd. No, no worries at all, really. <laughs> um, so I, I have a few follow-up questions. I don't know if you have any, Mark, that might come, but I'll, I'll give you a chance to do that in a second to ask away. Um, so my my first my first question is: I know that there are a lot of researchers and students interested in and in starting to work with the UN. What advice do you have for them? Well, it's um, it's hard to know where to begin. I don't, I, many of my former students actually are now working um, for the UN. Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, I'm, I'm teaching now at the Graduate Institute in Geneva, so it's relatively easier for our students to gain access uh, to positions, but uh, mainly because uh, if, you're, if you're in either New York or in Geneva, maybe Vienna, but mainly these are the two main cities of the United Nations system. And I oftentimes, what I tell my students here is I say, um, go take an internship. Um, I know there are all sorts of challenges and problems of unpaid internships, but um, increasingly now the UN is offering not really a living wage, but at least a token subsidy. So one of my, uh, one of my master's students from last year is now working at uh, UNIDIR, the UN Institute for, uh, for Disarmament uh, and, and Study Research. And... Uh, I think he only gets a stipend of about maybe $1,200 a month. Um, so it's not a living wage, uh, but it, it does subsidize his cost of living. And this gives him the access to people working within that organization. He's actually been assigned, he's rather, he's, 
I shouldn't go into great details about Unidir here, but uh, he he thinks he's been assigned some very responsible things for someone who's just on a temporary six month uh, internship. Um, but he's through that process, he's meeting all sorts of other people, networking very effectively. So that's one way. But that's easy to say here in Geneva because not only do our students work at the UN directly, but many of them work for their governments. Um, the fact of the matter is that uh, many of the missions here in Geneva don't have large enough staffs to cover all the meetings that are being convened here on a daily basis. And as a result, uh, they hire nationals, um, th their nationals who happen to be our students to go and take notes and meetings for them. And I had one who um, was writing, a, actually he got his thesis topic out of his internship working for the Czech government because he was being assigned to the disarmament conference, which isn't doing anything. Uh, in Geneva, unfortunately, due to the consensus rule. But then he also went to um, WIPO. No, I'm sorry, to the ITU, the International uh, Telecommunications Union. And he discovered that their consensus wasn't blocking activity. And so he decided to write a, a PhD thesis on consensus and how different, how consensus means different things in different international organizations and went into the culture of it. So uh, sometimes the, the careers can take multiple different directions. Uh, he's now working as a diplomat. Um, he's uh, now that he's finished, but um, that's if you're in one of these locations, uh, and of course, you can also work for the non governmental organizations or the business lobbying organizations. Um, I, I guess for US based students, the functional equivalent of that would be being in Washington and taking advantage of the activities there. Um, but I would say Two, two more things about in general. Um, so I, I've really privileged too much just the, the location and access to events. Um, increasingly now we have more and more events online, webinar events. And I would encourage students to take advantage of, of this. This is really a new phenomenon. We didn't really have this before COVID. And I think I, I find myself um, tuning in to a number of webinars that are based in North America that I wouldn't otherwise have attended. I've, I've also participate, uh, participated in a webinar in Nigeria talking about Russia and Ukraine. So I think increasingly, uh, if you participate in these kinds of activities, uh, not only do you learn something, but you can make yourself known by posing a question. Mm -hmm. uh, by, by uh, Of course, if it's an in-person event, you can go up to someone afterwards, but you could even follow up with many of these events. Many of us are accessible online in different ways. So there are lots of ways of, of making yourself known. So that's 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 one way of, of, of starting off. Another is to uh, develop an expertise. And all of our, all students have expertise. I mean, it, they may not think so um, because, but when you're writing a thesis about something, you develop, uh, I think, an expertise on that topic. That is, you know more about the subject than anybody mm -hmm. else. And most often you know more about it even than your thesis supervisor. Uh, you know, now, oftentimes students when writing dissertations think, well, you know, I, I don't really, I'm not really an expert, but, but I think an expert is, is somebody who knows what they don't know. I, I, I like that. I like the fact that, you know, you, you, you're also talking about imposter syndrome, right? So students, mm -hmm. yep. um, researchers don't give themselves enough credit for what they know. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, that's really important to acknowledge. And, and I think this, this expertise is, is sort of a ticket to, to, to access on many different issues. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and yes, yeah, don't, don't sell yourself short. One final tip or one final piece of advice, and I just gave it to, uh, to a couple of students uh, the other day in my regular office hours in Geneva. Uh, and someone said, like, like, like most of us, like myself, I mean, when I started out, I wasn't sure if I would pursue an academic career or a policy career. Mm -hmm. And I applied both for academic positions and policy <laughs> positions when I finished my PhD at MIT. Uh, so I oftentimes say, keep your options open. I mean, don't, don't foreclose yourself. Don't narrow things. Uh, of course, ultimately, when you make choices in life, it's like a tree, a tree branch. You, you're going on this branch, not another branch. But I think it's important to try to uh, to keep options open and and not prevent yourself from from exploring other opportunities. So. That would be my other general advice. Mm -hmm. Can I just jump in with a with a, a question, sort of a question and comment? So, Tom, you probably know that ISA has done some collaborations with UNAI, UN Academic Impact, 
particularly in in the New York area, mm -hmm. um, that were very very successful. I mean, uh, several hundred attendees on multiple occasions. You know, oftentimes largely from uh, you know sort of greater New York area schools would bring you know whole classes along, but. Um, uh, you know, they, they were really interesting. And then a lot of that, you know, quite, quite naturally slowed down with COVID. Um, and we're hoping to re-engage some of those things with the UN. Are there other ways that you could envision ISA as a member-focused organization engaging with the UN in ways that, that help our members provide opportunities for, you know, whatever, um, and just knowing the system better than certainly I do, um, I just put that on the table for you to comment on. Sure. I mean, I, I think there are um, a number of different ways to uh, to engage. First of all, of course, it, it's important to keep in mind that the UN is this incredibly yes. complex, diverse set of organizations, institutions, programs, funds. Uh, in fact, I, I, I oftentimes when I'm teaching my course on, on global governance, I'll put up the slide, the organogram of the UN and say, that's the UN uh, yeah. and say, now the, the next time you say the UN said such and such, figure out who in the UN where. So that just as a caveat, it, it's hard yeah. to know where to, to enter. I do think there are, going back to the point about expertise though, I think there are areas where um, research collaborations uh, could be could be useful. And this isn't maybe, uh, maybe it's something that can be done in different sections of the ISA rather mm -hmm. than, than at, at headquarters, but but with headquarters support, um, because a, a couple of years ago I uh, co-organized a workshop with the UN University um, here in Geneva, and it was called "Strengthening the UN's Research Uptake." Oh. And the the premise of the of the workshop was to say most UN agencies are having are facing funding cutbacks, governments are reducing funding, and so the question was how can uh, and, and of course when when institutions and funds are facing cutbacks in funding, one of the first things they cut is research. Yeah. And so the question was, are there ways of connecting research to policy practice? Mm -hmm. And to be, to be fair, it's, it's, it's challenging on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, it's challenging uh, in the way that, um, and we've had a number of panels. Uh, I've, I've done a number of panels with, uh, I know it was both Tom Weiss and, and Ann Tickner's uh, themes and when they were ISA president to talk about engagement between policy and, and scholarly work. And it's not easy because we face a lot of, of historical prejudices against policy engagement in the scholarly world. I think that's that's changing now. I think I think the new generation of scholars is more open to policy engagement. Uh, but it's been an ongoing struggle. So there are, are, are barriers within uh, the scholarly community to engagement, but there are also barriers on the other side. Um, and there's a there's a question about um, there's too much information out there. How do we know what's of high quality and what's not of high quality? Uh, and there's also a lack of reciprocity. So UN organizations will sometimes say uh, we're actually um, we're we're interested in in access to the data that you have within the international organization, but in fact. Uh, they have a number of, of both legal and privacy reasons why they can't share data and information. So uh, the collaborations are difficult. I don't want to minimize them. But I think if you get a specific issue domain uh, and work on bringing together um, scholars and policy practitioners, that's that's one way of, of engaging. Uh, but it probably has to be fairly narrowly focused. If it's too generic or too general, it's not going to work in my view. Just one follow-up. You might want to engage. Um, in fact, I think one of my former PhDs from Brown, Joel Ostreich, was the head of the IO section yeah. for a number of years. So um, uh, he, I, I know, has been active in these. He's also simultaneously active in ACOMS, the Academic Council on the UN System that I mentioned previously. And that's another organization that more mm -hmm. collaboration with uh, could pay off at, at, a, at a general level, because I would say there's a pretty high overlap between ISA membership and, and ACOMS membership. And so uh, maybe organizing some joint events. Um, Aikens is a much smaller organization, right. uh, much less well-financed. Uh, I think the, I'm, I'm a former board member. I think I think Aikens, I can't speak for Aikens today, but uh, and when I was on the board, I certainly would have welcomed some kind of engagement. So that's that's more of an institutional thing that could be done at headquarters. Right. I think, and in fact, I think Joel is back in as 
IO chair. Okay. <laughs> really, but, but Joel was okay. was really the uh, the point person who organized some of those first seminars in the New York area, uh -huh. um, and really did a terrific job as as uh, running those programs uh, early on. So yeah, yeah. Well, and one one follow up on that, you might want also to think about something we started a couple of years ago, but then it just didn't continue for a variety. Well, mainly because of COVID. Um, we were working with the Dog Hammarskjöld Foundation in Sweden, yeah. and um, also with the journal Global Governance. Mm -hmm. uh, I know it's a rival journal, but uh, it was a, whatever. whatever. Uh, and uh, we started organizing events um, that were taking the same issue, but discussing it both in New York and in Geneva. Yeah. It turns out not only uh, are there the so-called three UNs, the member states, the secretariat, and all the others around us that interact with the UN, uh, but there are also, there's New York UN and there's Geneva UN, and they're very different. Uh, most of my research, of, of course, is New York-based, just as the webinar I just came from was, was the seminar I came from was New York-based. Um, but in Geneva, there's oftentimes an attitude that um, we want to keep New York out of Geneva. Uh, keep keep the politics, the high politics out yeah. of Geneva. Uh, and Geneva then tries to uh, think of itself as, as superior to because it's dealing with human rights, it's dealing with welfare, it's dealing with health, it's dealing with, with working conditions and so on. Um, but I spoke a few years ago to one of the director general's assistants here, and he's, he, he'd come from Ban Ki-moon staff to work uh, at UNOG, the UN office in Geneva. And I asked him about this, uh, and he said, well, Sometimes I think there isn't enough New York in Geneva. <laughs> and it's a bit too unrealistic yeah. in Geneva. And he said the human rights is pretty prevalent <laughs> in New York. So you don't need to worry about that as much. But there, well, anyway, because of this, the two different UNs, we tried to organize events that would discuss the same paper with a New York audience and with a Geneva oh, audience. Yeah. And that started revealing that different people would interpret, read the same essay very differently. Right. And and we would actually have it. Um, I think it was when we had a, a when global governance had a was was being managed out of uh, the One Earth Foundation. No, is it next One Earth? Not One Earth Foundation. Anyway, I mean, didn't get this wrong. But it, I, they're based in Boulder, Colorado. I can't remember the name. Maybe it is One Earth uh, Foundation. And they had had funding and a very creative managing editor. And um, they actually provided for these uh, the funding for these kinds of meetings. And and the authors of the papers went to meetings to discuss their work, both in New York and Geneva, and also learned a great deal from it. So these are the kind of creative things that can be done, but I don't want to be too New York and Geneva centric on this because uh, most of the world lives outside of these two places. And as the as the uh, co-chair of the global IR section, I must say, I have to uh, yeah. draw attention to the fact that uh, those of us in New York and Geneva are access to these two places are privileged and and have uh, have a privileged access to, to influence or, or discussion or participation. So. Let, let, let me follow up with one one other sort of uh, direct question about research, and particularly for um, you know some of our younger colleagues who are looking for data, looking for material to work with. And it's just a, a very quick story. Um, you know, I haven't done a lot of work on the UN, but Dave Bobro and I had done a bit of work on peacekeeping in the later '90s. And at one point, we were looking for some peacekeeping data. And I just called up the UN peacekeeping office in New York and happened upon a, uh, an officer who said, oh yeah, I've got all that data in my drawer. And he said, I can probably share that with you. And about a month later, I literally got a box <laughs> filled with Xeroxes that he had made for us. And it was the first time this data had been made public. Wow. And we used it for a piece that was published in, in uh, the Journal of Conflict Resolution. Now mm -hmm. all of that data is available on the UN website. You can download all of that material. But are there are there ways that we could think about, and again, I mean, this is just sort of putting a, uh, an idea on the table, to do a better job of helping particularly our younger colleagues to find what data actually exists and what kinds of things the UN can offer that may not be published, that may not be uh, readily available. It's it's accessible, mm -hmm. but it's not, um, and it and it's not, you know, it's not privileged information, mm -hmm. but it's material that may not be uh, as widely available as you know uh, things on the website or in some of the major UNESCO publications or whatever. So 
just sort of curious. That, that's a great story about, in fact, I thought you were going to say just the opposite, that he said, I have all this stuff, but I can't share it with you. I'm afraid. <laughs> um, you're right. Uh, on the one hand, there's much, much more information available online today. Um, and a lot of it uh, is being, it, it's not just uh, the data as, mm -hmm. as gathered by or categorized by the UN system for its own purposes, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, because all data are, are subject to different assumptions, different, uh, different definitions. Uh, and sometimes the data may look very attractive, but it's actually has embedded within it certain concepts and, and definitions that, that inhibit research at a certain level. Um, but now, of course, uh, with the availability of, of textual analysis, it's possible mm -hmm. for people to do much more systematic analysis rather than just pouring through Security Council resolution after resolution, trying to understand what are they thinking of or what are they trying to do. Uh, so it can be made much more systematic. Uh, so, so I think uh, there's a lot of material. And the UN, uh, <clears throat> not across the board, but, but when they have resources, have, have become much better at, at making things available. And I should add, not just in English, but in, in five other languages. So in that sense, it's much, much more accessible. Uh, the downside is... Um, they don't necessarily part with everything. Yeah. Um, and this is something that, um, I mean, I'm very glad you were able to get the peacekeeping data in. As you probably now know, there are a whole series of, of different research uh, projects out of NUPI and, and, uh, and, and also out of G. I I mean, a num number of scholars who've been working on, on peace operations uh, and, and with, with different data sets. Um, my only complaint about that work is that uh, like the sanctions people ourselves, or the mediation people, we don't talk to each other enough because the UN is using all these different instruments, but we don't, we, we, we replicate the kind of pathologies that exist within the organization. But one, one anecdote about the sanctions material, um, as I say, I work uh, quite closely with the sanctions branch and, and in the secretariat and have uh, access to information um, that I have a privileged access be, uh, to just even the, the slides and the presentation I just heard, and extraordinary amounts of detail about how many meetings, how many notes, uh, how many uh, decisions are being taken, how many visits. I mean, really in the weeds kind of work, but it gives one a sense of how the UN Secretariat functions and how the sanctions committees function. Um, but as a scholar of sanctions committees, a few years ago, um, they used to have everything online. And for those of us doing historical analysis of all UN sanctions regimes, that was a great resource we could go back, even though a lot of it was in the kind of boxes that you described that were sent to you uh, from New York. Um, now, increasingly, it was being made available online, but that was only for the more recent cases. The historical cases were still in the boxes. Yeah. So here's a, just a problem of, of access to data and information. Um, and, uh, and also the privilege part. I mean, I, when the UN closes a sanctions regime, they take all the material off, offline. And they do that um, for a very good reason. They're doing it because the individuals who might have been mentioned or designated or listed for sanctions are no longer under sanctions. But if they're still findable on the UN website, uh, that's a stigmatization that affects their life, their career, their opportunities. Uh, rumors could could start, uh, you know, they were on the UN sanctions list. And so the UN took all that information down offline, no longer accessible. The problem for those of us as scholars, if we're trying to say, well, who was targeted? Why were they targeted? What were the effects of this and the historical cases? Now we lose 50% of the cases historically because that information is no longer accessible. Um, so it's, um, I, I made a mistake as a researcher um, once sitting down with the data person uh, in the secretariat to talk about this. And because I said, oh, that's not a problem. We just use the time machine and go back in time and figure out what's available, right? Okay. Well, that was stupid. I shouldn't have done that. There's advice for scholars because immediately the data person then immediately found ways to get around the time machine. Uh, so, in fact, um, we should be careful when we're, we're having these candid discussions with uh, policy practitioners who want access to information. But that's that's just one one narrative about this. But uh, I'm 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 glad that that you found someone who was that willing to share the information for that project. So. Yeah, yeah, very good, Sarah. You want so to we have a question from an audience member, um, and it's it's quite a detailed question. 
So I'm, I was thinking to allow um, Anton to, just to ask it to talking permitted. So Anton, do you want to um, run through your question for Tom? Uh, yeah, hi there. <clears throat> uh, so I uh, have a big picture question sort of that hopefully fits this, uh, this format and I'll try to keep it shorter than what I typed out. Um, basically, what do you think is the, the sort of the, the next big thing or two for sanctions research, either UN sanctions or unilateral ones? Sort of what are the promising paths for future work on sanctions? Sort of A, on, on substance, right? Giving the, the you know, current trends such as the absence of new sanctions regimes in the Security Council, the Russian posture in the Security Council, the increase in Magnitsky type legislation and sanctions. Mm -hmm. And then B, sort of on research design. You mentioned the like text as data approaches. Um, are there any other sort of research design innovations in recent years, you know, causal inference uh, uh, sort of stuff, new sanctions data sets that are being released um, that like might help us move beyond the fairly coarse country year uh, quantitative analysis that's very prominent and is, is very important, but mm -hmm. we can make, you know, what are, what is, you know, what's your uh, view on these two aspects, uh, especially since you've been, you, you have such a, a sort of long, uh, long-term view on the development of sanctions research over the past decade. Thank right. you. Terrific. Thanks very much. Anton, can you tell me where you're from? Uh, so uh, Peace Research Institute Frankfurt, University of Frankfurt, and I'm visiting uh, Nuffield at Oxford uh, right now. Okay, excellent. Uh, very good. Uh, I've been a resident fellow at Nuffield twice myself, so enjoy your time. <laughs> uh, let, let me... Uh, Start with a question about um, research and, and, and direction for sanctions research. I think there are a couple of uh, important trends to, to take into consideration. You've already highlighted a couple of them. Well, first, let me let me address the um, Security Council gridlock question uh, first. Um, it turns out they just passed a sanctions resolution on the 22nd of October, which surprised me. I guess I had a heads up, but I wasn't expecting it. I've been um, making a standard uh, spiel about uh, gridlock in the council uh, and uh, pointing out that there hasn't been a new sanctions regime since 2017 on Mali. Uh, and also some research I did with one of my former PhD students here, Aurel Niederberger, uh, where we were looking at the patterns of listings and delistings by the UN uh, over time. And we found that for the last three years, 2019, 20, and 21, there were more people uh, being delisted by the UN than listed, which meant there was no consensus to add any new names to reinvigorate the existing regimes. And if anything, they were simply cleaning up and, and, and delisting individuals. Uh, obviously, each case is, is unique. But um, then all of a sudden, it was actually this summer, I, I co-teach, uh, we do a week-long seminar here in Geneva with uh, uh, with the sanctions branch, and we bring in member states, um, other branches of the secretariat like peacekeeping or mediation support or OCHA, um, private sector individuals and panels of experts. And uh, Eric Martzoff, who's the current uh, uh, head, of the, uh, head of the sanctions branch, um, said as an aside, uh, late July, he said, uh, take a look at this resolution on Haiti. If nothing happens in a few months, we might have a new sanctions regime. And lo and behold, uh, as of October 22nd, we in fact have a new sanctions resolution, nine pager, I have it right here, <laughs> uh, resolution 2653, uh, which is interesting for a number of reasons. Now, I'm not going to get too much in the weeds about this, but it's interesting because one, there's a new sanctions regime for the first time in five years. Uh, and two, I think it was brokered through China initially uh, that must have asked Russia not to block. I haven't checked the votes on the resolution. I should do that. Um, it contains, um, it's targeted as a usual kind of asset freeze, travel ban, uh, arms embargo. It's focused on gangs and gang violence. So it's not a traditional threat to peace and security. So there's another innovation within this particular resolution. Uh, but it also has, um, it re repeats the humanitarian carve out paragraph that was in the Afghan Taliban resolution at the end of 2021. And 
it includes uh, something I've been working on for a number of years, quite important, at least in my view, uh, and that is due process rights for individuals who are targeted for sanctions, because it calls upon, uh, where is this? Um, I don't have the exact text. I'm going to read it here. Um, basically, it suggests that the office of the ombudsperson should have a role in considering delisting requests. And that's a breakthrough because up to this point, delisting has only been done by the uh, Al-Qaeda ISIL committee. No other, no other committees have, have mandates or no uh, procedures for getting off the list. So it has a number of interesting features. So it appears in spite of all the gridlock, in spite of all the geopolitics, that the council is still functioning in some way. And this resolution is indicative of this. I think a lot of this is sort of action uh, happening um, sort of in the weeds but when I talk about um, give, give talks or lectures on UN reform, I, I always encourage people to move away from focus on Security Council membership reform and start considering things like um, the kinds of micro adjustments within resolutions, adjustments to existing sanctions committees um, that really appear very technical and in the weeds, but there's this kind of incremental change that's happening. And I think we oftentimes, we don't see it because we're looking for the big, big picture change. Um, that, not, not that I'm not going to give you a big picture response now. Uh, so that, that's a long uh, preface. Uh, so what's next in, in sanctions research? So until this resolution, uh, my standard argument was, well, uh, the next... Um, we're seeing gridlock at the council. Therefore, uh, we're seeing a new kind of informal governance uh, in world politics, this informal multilateral cooperation between the US, the UK, the EU, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea, Singapore, all working together, mostly, uh, with sanctions on Russia. And so I would have said, um, give up looking at the Security Council. Not much is happening there. Uh, but I still think, of course, there are a number of cases uh, where this kind of multilateral cooperation on sanctions does exist with regard to uh, Syria, Venezuela, Myanmar, and other cases. So um, I, th I do think that uh, we do need more research on these kinds of coordination, cooperation between autonomous sanction centers. And uh, Russia is the obvious case, but it's existed in other cases. Uh, more recently. So I think that's one area uh, for promising research. How does it work? How does it function? Even uh, to what extent is it really there? I think uh, I saw a, 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 a organic, no, a figure it wasn't organic, it was a, just a union intersection of sets um, figure that uh, Bloomberg Financial put out. And it was quite striking that the individuals, the so-called oligarchs that are sanctioned in Russia, uh, over the invasion of Crimea, uh, not Crimea, sorry, Ukraine, uh, no, and Crimea. Uh, in fact, they don't overlap. There's not there, there's about high overlap between any two of the three main parties, the US, UK, and, and EU. Uh, but in terms of the intersection of those three, it's in, in, in the hundreds, whereas there are thousands of people designated. So it's interesting to look at how much cooperation, how much coordination. Uh, and um, one of my own current research uh, issues uh, that I'm most interested in looking at right now, and I think is a relatively um, under-researched, is uh, sanctions relief. And how sanctions, not just applying sanctions, but relieving sanctions can be used to facilitate mediation, negotiations of different sorts. The challenge is with multiple senders, this becomes an extraordinarily complex problem because you might get delisted in one setting, but not in another. And so it's not as if it's a one-stop fits all or shop fits all kind of uh, UN sanctions regime, but, but this multi informal multilateralism, it's a much, much, much more complex regime. Uh, so that'll be a problem for, for work in the future, but I'm, I'm uh, developing a typology of forms of sanctions relief and then applying it to North Korea, probably Russia at some point, uh, and, and cases where, the, where there are almost no sanctions present. So that's the second area. Third area, uh, you mentioned Magnitsky. I, I do see an increase in the use of what we would call thematic uh, sanctions regimes rather than country-based regimes. Uh, and um, this has not gone very far at the UN level. There was an attempt a couple of years ago to put um, sexual and gender-based violence uh, on the agenda as a thematic 
uh, non-territorially linked sanctions regime at the UN level. Uh, that was pushed back pretty, it was pushed forward by a couple of EU, uh, not EU, EU members, non-permanent uh, non EU members, elected members of the council. Um, it didn't get very far, but again, incremental change. Uh, we start seeing more and more people being designated for sexual and gender-based violence rather than being a separate freestanding committee. But this move away from country-based to thematic-based, which means they're deterritorialized in a certain sense, uh, is, I think, a trend we're certainly seeing uh, at the national level in the U.S., um, in the U.K., uh, as it's now developing its own sanctions regime, and also at the EU level. So there is this kind of development that, that has been taking place. Um, Magnitsky, um, I wish someone would do research on the impact, the, the effectiveness of these measures. Um, we see Magnitsky now being broadly applied. There's even the U.S. has gone from the Russia Magnitsky to global Magnitsky, which they call GLOMAG. Uh, only, only Washington could come up with that uh, abbreviation or summary of, of the global Magnitsky. Um, but it's now, of course, uh, been adopted in Canada, Australia, the U.K., Europe has its own. It doesn't use the word Magnitsky, but very comparable. Um, and the research on Magnitsky type sanctions, I, I say this because I've given testimony to parliaments in both uh, Canada, uh, UK, and, and Australia on Magnitsky, um, when asked, do they work? I say, we don't really know. Uh, that is, there's not sufficient research on individual sanctions of this sort. Um, now, the reasons are obvious because it's hard to gain access to these people. It's hard to gain, get even if you gain access, to get honest responses from them about how these sanctions uh, affect them because in, in, inordinately will, in, invariably will lead to them um, not wanting to talk about how they manage to survive and evade the measures. Uh, but I do think that's a research uh, blind spot at the moment uh, that, that we're missing. One, one final point related to that in terms of research blind spots is um, so much of the literature, and I include myself and my own work uh, in, included in this, is focused on the perspective of the sender. Very little work is done on the targets of sanctions, the receivers of sanctions, or even those intended to receive the signals of the sanctions. And there, I think, um, I think, I think it's 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 addressable. I know uh, there's a actually somebody in uh, no not in Frankfurt. No, she's in in Hamburg at Giga. Uh, Julia Gralvogel has been writing, a she wrote her dissertation about the politics of how this sanctions played out in domestic politics in both Zimbabwe and Burundi, not looking at UN cases, but looking at EU sanctions cases. Uh, but there's very little research on, on how the sanctions are perceived, how they're received, how they're used, um, how targets see them, and how targets uh, address and deal with them. So that's a, a broad area, I think, that, that could be addressed. Finally, with regard to um, data, um, Yes, there are, there are, I mentioned the Texas data already. There are new sanctions data sets, but be careful. Uh, <clears throat> I say that because I'm, I'm teaching my sanctions. Uh, I teach a seminar at the Graduate Institute uh, Research, Advanced Research Seminar on International Sanctions. And if you're interested, send me an email. I'll send you my slides. I created a couple of slides about the different databases that currently exist on sanctions. And I compared the usual suspects, how far shot in Elliott, ties, I put ourselves in that out of our JPR 2018 article, uh, but uh, comparing the targeted sanctions consortium data with the other two. Um, then there are these new two new sanctions. There's uh, EU Sanct and um, Global Sanctions Database, GSDB. Um, the latter, GSDB, I think is mainly focused on just the growth of the, I mean, keep in mind, all, all databases are created for particular purposes. Uh, and again, like all data, they, they contain the biases and assumptions of the research questions being posed. Uh, but they seem to be primarily focused on just assessing the increase in the magnitude of the sanctions. Um, I'm not so sure about the details inside. EU Sanct um, pretends to be, a, all cumulative, and, and I think it is trying to do something that really should be done, uh, and that is in, have have data from EU, US, and UN put together in a single database, and that's clearly the fault of, of, of TSC. Um, the problem is uh, just you have more sanctions 
included, but it's at the expense of more detail about those sanctions regimes. And here again, looking comparatively across the different regimes, um, I think it, it's not surprising we developed the TSC database out of empirical case studies. And so we have fewer cases, but many, many more variables, whereas the larger databases have many, many more cases, uh, in part because I think they cheat by by putting um, non-sanctions into their databases so they can have a larger N and do more sophisticated uh, statistical manipulation. But, uh, and I think the country country year is also a, just a way of, of, of creating something that's not really independent or unique or new. So I, I can I get off my soapbox on, on some of the large N work and, and the problems, but there's a trade-off here because you get more cases, but you get less information about them. So just, just be aware of that. One other thing on databases though, um, look into private databases. Uh, there are a whole series of, now most of these are trying to sell them to compliance departments and banks. Uh, but the Karen Reed book has a very useful event summary. They're sending this out mainly to uh, to uh, compliance officers, but it's uh, it has useful notes about what OFAC is doing, what the EU has just done, what the UK has designated, and so on. Uh, and it has it in in sort of text events form. So uh, some of these private and that's that's a publicly shared. I'm sure if you subscribe, you get much more information. That's the whole point. But. Um, that group, Maya Lester's uh, uh, site in the UK, she also charges a fee for access. But uh, I've got a couple of slides where I talk about the, the different uh, databases coming from, uh, from the private sector as well. So we've got a mix of different sources. And then finally, government sources, of course. So anyway, long answer uh, to a, a broad and complex question, but thanks. Hope, hope, hope that answered your question. But if not, let us know. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you so much uh, for that. I'll 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 send you an email uh, after this. Thanks so much. Okay. Yeah. So that that was a great question. We have time for one one more question, and I just wanted to follow up a little bit on um, kind of a, a broad view on the Russian sanctions. So you 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 mentioned them a little bit, but could you talk a little bit more about their impacts, their effectiveness? Mm -hmm their cost to senders and how they might ultimately end? Lots of questions there. Impact, effectiveness, cost to senders, and how they end. I uh, mean, feel free to, to pick. <laughs> no, I'm happy to give a go at, at any of them. Let me start off with what I, I, uh, what I think of as, uh, as a couple of myths, maybe three myths um, attributed to, uh, associated with the Russia sanctions. Um, let me preface this by saying I'm, I'm not, I'm not writing a paper yet on the Russia sanctions. I'm just gathering lots of information. So I'm following this quite closely, quite frankly, mainly because of the number of requests I've had for media interviews about the Russia sanctions. Uh, but a couple of the myths, uh, about them, uh, one to begin with is, and I just wish people would stop repeating this. Uh, people keep referring to the Russia sanctions as unprecedented. Uh, and quite frankly, they're not. Uh, there's nothing being imposed on Russia that hasn't been imposed on some other country by some sanctioning body. Uh, so uh, export controls, that, that's not new. Um, financial restrictions, use of SWIFT, uh, none of this is new. Uh, so I'm, 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 I'm actually, I, now I can advertise a panel that will be on the Montreal program of the ISA in uh, March 2023 about sort of what's new in Russia sanctions. And so I'm having a bunch of people who are working on this to come together and say what's really unique and different about this set of sanctions. Um, but there's nothing that hasn't been applied elsewhere. They're not even as extensive as the sanctions currently being applied to North Korea by the UN or to Iran by the US. So um, they're not unprecedented in type of sanctions. They're not unprecedented in scope. I mean, you can still engage in, in transactions with Russia. Um, not so easy, uh, but it's possible. Um, trade is not forbidden across the board. There, there are many, many sectors of the economy in which, which one can engage in transactions. Not to say that it's easy, but it, it's still possible. Uh, but what's, what is unprecedented, in my view, is the... It's unprecedented with regard to Russia. So in terms of nothing as extensive has been applied to Russia before, that, okay, that's, that's, that's one. Um, second, um, it's unprecedented with regard to such a large economy that was so integrated into the world economy. So that's, that's enough, because most sanctions regimes are 
are applied to countries that are relatively um, weaker players in the international economy with much less capacity to retaliate with countermeasures. Uh, Iran being perhaps the exception, but not very much in terms of countermeasures. So this is the first. So th th so but when we say unprecedented, let's just be precise about what we mean by that and not all this hyperbole about the unprecedented sanctions on Russia. Um, the second myth, and here I, I, uh, I unfortunately missed his talk here, Nicholas Mulder's recent book on economic warfare, uh, which I am about to review and as soon as I receive it from the uh, journal that said they want me to review it. So I haven't read the book. I've read a lot about it. I've heard him in a couple of presentations. Uh, and I'm looking forward to it. Excuse me, that's a bird clock in the background. I don't know if you can hear that, but <laughs> it's a, anyway, it's six o'clock, five o'clock. Anyway, it's over now. Don't worry. It's not a bird in the house, not to worry. They're, they're all around this. Um, so Mulder's work, I, I, I am looking forward to reading because I really think we don't understand enough about sanctions applied during the League of Nations period. Uh, and I think uh, I think the promise of the book, at least as I've, I've read on, on, on blurbs and, and some descriptions of it, uh, is to have a better understanding of where this restrictive measure comes from, the idea it comes from. Where I think I depart, and again, I have to read the book in order to, to develop the argument, but is the overuse of the term economic warfare. Uh, because if you read the sanctions literature, um, go back to the classics, go back to David Baldwin's uh, pioneering work, Economic Statecraft, which came out with a new edition uh, just in 2020. Uh, but also um, look at Robert Pape's critique of Huffbauer, Schott, and Elliott's uh, analysis in, in the pages of, of international security back in the late 90s. Um, both of them go to great pains to say, don't conflate economic sanctions or sanctions with economic warfare and with other instruments of restrictive policy measures used. Uh, that in fact, you're conflating their different categories, different purposes. Uh, and I would argue it plays into the discourse of Russia itself because then Russia can say, well, economic warfare against us, therefore what we're doing is legitimate. And they've actually used that, that argument. So I think it's dangerous both on political grounds, but also on, on analytical grounds. I think we have reasons to keep these, these categories different. Uh, there's enough diversity in, in sanctions regimes alone to start throwing at what, what you do during declared formal war with another party in terms of restrictive measures. So I think um, that's, that's my second myth. The third is um, that this, this is more of a local issue, I suppose, um, but being, uh, being residing and working in Switzerland, um, there's nothing new about Swiss sanctions. When I've seen so many references, even Switzerland or the end of Swiss neutrality. Well, no, I'm sorry. Uh, for the last 20 years, Switzerland has been engaged in applying uh, sanctions. Um, it, it didn't always. Uh, Switzerland remains a neutral country. Just because you're applying sanctions, it doesn't mean you're you're applying restrictive measures here in support of your normative foreign policy goals. It doesn't mean that you lost your neutrality. Uh, but nonetheless, um, there's a lot of hype about Switzerland as well. So now I got that out of the way. Um, so there's nothing new. Ask, ask uh, Lukashenko or ask Maduro. Um, they're designated by Switzerland uh, by the, by the despite. Um, the absence of a, a robust, uh, anyway, it's not, it's not a challenge to Swiss neutrality. Um, impact, it's too soon to say. Now that seems like a cop out, but just keep one point in mind. And that is that the oil restrictions that the US imposed, uh, mainly because the US doesn't really import any oil to, of any significant amount from Russia, the European uh, restrictions don't go into effect until next year. So arguably one of the biggest restrictive measures has yet to be applied. Uh, the UK, I think goes at the end of January. So it's, it's not even at the beginning of the year. Uh, so while Europe has done, a, a, I think quite an admirable job of uh, disengaging from the, uh, certainly from, from natural gas dependency, numbers are down quite significantly. Um, the, the impact, potential impact of, of the most, significant, I think, and far-reaching, maybe semiconductors coming second, uh, but, but in terms of far-reaching measures, uh, have yet to be implemented. Um, so it's easy to say, oh, sanctions aren't working. Putin hasn't given up and pulled out of Ukraine. Well, I had that from one of the ambassadors, actually, not on Russia, but it was on, on North Korea in the session I just had a little while ago. Uh, and it's, um, it, it is too soon to say. Uh, now, some, that being said, some sanctions impacts are immediate. If you're an oligarch, 
uh, that yacht that you is, is now tied up in some Italian port. Okay, but that that's fairly quick, or an asset freeze uh, is is fairly quick. Um, not probably quick enough if you're a smart enough oligarch and many of them did get their a lot of money out. But nonetheless, um, the impact uh, of some types of sanctions are immediate, but others are much much longer term. So we need to sort of differentiate between the different types. Um, also, we need to get beyond just sanctions. Uh, as if it's one thing. Sanctions are a, a whole host of restrictive measures applied to sectors, applied to, to messaging systems, applied to communications, applied to uh, to, to major export commodities, imports. Um, and, and so you need to look at those sanctions, combinations of measures that are in place at any given point in time before we can start talking about the impact. Now I do have a in in this on, on as I say I have this like twenty page single space uh, notes about something I'll write in the future about Russia sanctions. Um, I'm keeping a list of evidence of impacts within Russia, and uh, I know there's a recent debate. I think it was in foreign policy between uh, Bruce Jettelson and um, um, gosh Jeffrey Sonnenfeld from Yale. Uh, about the impact of the Russia sanctions. So I would recommend taking a look at that in terms of, of assessments of impact. Sonnenfeld and his colleagues are the ones who've been tracking all of the voluntary divestments that have taken place. Now, there is something that I think is unique to the Russia case. That is, we don't usually have this much voluntary civil society activity when you have so many people who are actually voluntarily, I'm thinking not just of the companies pulling out of Russia, but the sports boycotts and other types of, of, uh, of, of voluntary measures that are being taken, not because governments say you must do this, but because people are voluntarily doing it. That's unusual. We had a bit of that with regard to South Africa in the 1980s and 90s and the divestment movement, but uh, nothing comparable. So that's, that is, is something significant. But on impact, um, it is a bit too soon to tell. Big things like semiconductors, these are gonna have long-term impacts on Russia. The marginalization and weakening of Russia and the world economy is is going to take place. And then we need to look at immediate impacts, intermediate, and then long-term. Um, effectiveness. Um, I think there's some evidence, if it's true that Russia is relying on um, pulling semiconductors out of appliances uh, to, to re resupply munitions, that's a pretty significant indication that they're effective not in changing behavior. And here's my standard uh, comments about uh, effectiveness of sanctions. It's not just did the target change its behavior, but was the target constrained in engaging in some proscribed activity? Or was an effective signaling sent, uh, a signal sent? That is, it's not okay to invade your neighbor and annex their territory. And that's really the big normative issue here. So we need to look not just at did Putin or Russia change its behavior, but is there evidence of constraint and an effective signal being sent? Um, I think there's some evidence of constraint. I think uh, there'll be more going forward. Um, I think as long as the resolve remains to, but obviously it's not the sanctions that are having the biggest impact here. It's it's the military support being provided. And of course the extraordinary uh, courage of the Ukrainian people in their resistance. On uh, cost descenders, um, we're in the midst of a game, a big game. Uh, I'm not a game theorist, but I think I can see the, uh, the possibilities of, of applying. I would like some game theorists to take a look at this. I think uh, Europe is is calling Putin's bluff and trying to conserve enough, be prepared, lower our thermostats, which I do here, have a wood fireplace, although that's polluting in another way, uh, but, but rely more on wood than electricity. Um, and basically threatening, uh, basically saying, um, you can shut it off, we'll, we'll be prepared for it. Uh, and then Russia becomes the loser. So we're it, we're in this very difficult moment at the moment. Thus far, it's been an extremely mild fall here in Europe. So in fact, we haven't really had this significant impact uh, up where I live in, in the Alps. Uh, we're expecting uh, snow this Friday. So um, this, this will change fairly quickly. Uh, but I think there's uh, basically, uh, notice that Russia hasn't up to this point stopped selling oil because Russia is also dependent on the export of oil, just as Europe is dependent on Russia's exports. Here we are to interdependence. And Russia can't just turn it off and switch it to East Asia. Not that China's willing to do it anyway, but, but in fact, it's shifting much of, of the export in, in tankers to India and, and China thus far, but not in a significant way. And it can't ship the pipelines, the oil, the, 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 the gas lines. Um, so finally, how will they end? 
Good question. Um, I think we need to think about that now or start thinking about it. Uh, that's why, as I mentioned earlier, in response to Anton's question, that I'm, I'm interested in developing ways of thinking about using sanctions as relief rather than as, uh, as, as, as punishments or, or as uh, attempts to try to prevent uh, the engagement of some kind of behavior. Um, so I think it's important to start thinking about sanctions relief now because at some point, and hopefully sooner rather than later, but at some point, there will be negotiations. Uh, we don't know who the parties will be. We don't know what the issues will be. Um, I think, but it's important to start thinking about how sanctions relief can be linked to specific uh, concessions, either on creating a ceasefire or getting parties to the table or negotiating uh, an agreement in good faith and then maintaining uh, commitment to that agreement. So I, I think, uh, and, and in this case, um, mm -hmm. there are lots of things to work with in terms of sanctions relief. The challenge is there are also many, many, many senders whose behavior needs to be coordinated because you can get relief from one party, but not from another, and therefore not have effective relief. That's what Iran discovered after the JCPOA. So anyway, um, big question, but uh, a long answer as usual. But uh, I don't think we have that many people in the chat as far as I can tell. So so thank you for that very thorough answer. It, it covered all the different aspects of my question. I really appreciate you taking the time to go through them. We, we do have um, one more question um, from one of our attendees. Are you okay with one more question? Taking Absolutely. One more? Yep. It's getting dark, but it's not that bad. So. <laughs> okay, I'm going to read this question from Jonathan. Okay. Um, he asks, are there any topics or methods you found um, that distinguish global IR work from mainstream IR, loosely defined? What potentials do you see for global IR knowledge when it comes to current international institutions like the UN and have you found the lens useful for certain areas? Great, thanks very much, uh, Jonathan, for that question. Yes, um, well, to some extent, I mean, global IR, at least um, we're still defining it. So I, I don't wanna speak, I may be the co-chair of the section, but uh, I think uh, it's a work in, in, in progress. We're, we're, we're working on it. We're not, uh, we're not finished with it, we're developing it. Um, that being said, it's not as if I don't have my own views about what I think constitutes uh, global IR uh, as an approach to our, our subject. And it goes back to uh, reflections from, I guess, my own career and, and, and career of teaching in, in different places in the world, having resided in, in Africa and North America, in Europe, uh, over the course of my career. Um, I think it's, um, for me, thinking globally about IR, you first have to come to terms with your own parochialism. And um, rather than saying, well, mainstream IR, I think all, all of our approaches are parochial to a certain extent. Uh, that is, we look at the world from a, a geographical location, from an institutional location, from a class location. We, uh, from um, civilizational traditions. We all have, have certain ways of thinking about the world. What are problems? What, what, are, what do we think about in terms of, of contemporary world order? So I think the first element of it is really to first reflect on our own parochialism. So I mentioned it earlier in terms of most of the sanctions research is, in my view, too much focused on the perspective of the sender and not as much on the target and, and the target's experience. But beyond that, I think um, a commitment to global IR means uh, a willingness to try, make the effort to understand the perspective of another on their own terms, not simply saying, well, that's not realistic or that's not real. I mean, it, 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 it's easy to project onto others our own worldviews and understandings, but I think it, it requires a, a sort of an open-ended effort to try an empathetic understanding of the views of others. Now, you might at the, one, one might at, at the outset say, well, isn't that ridiculous? You're giving all, everything has equal value. 
and I'm not trying to to say all say all that all, all views are equally valid. What I'm trying to say is, at the first instance, we need to make an attempt to try to understand the perspective of the other, of an other, uh, and then then I think we need to engage. Then I think we need to interrogate, and and, and not, it, it sounds like interrogation. We need to have a dialogue, a, a discussion. Why do you think that? Where does that view come from? What's the basis for that? Uh, but I think that's that's the that's for me uh, fundamentally the idea of of taking a multi-perspectivist view, but not saying that all ideas are created equal. I think we then need to have this norm normative engagement and and dialogue about things. And so, for example, one of the things we did as a section recently, uh, you know, just last September, just last month, was we had uh, a global situation room that my co-chair Vinduka Kubalkova. Uh, chaired, and she had a group of us from all over the world. I happened to be in Qatar that week, uh, commenting on uh, actually a book launch of one of my former PhD students there. He's now teaching there. But I was uh, joined by colleagues from China, from India, from who may be based at the moment in North America, but whose work is historically on Africa. Uh, and the idea was to have a global conversation about uh, the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine. Notice I didn't preface it by saying the illegal Russian invasion. You know, there are lots of ways of, of, of providing those kinds of things. And what I did in the first move, although it proved to be a little controversial for one of the other participants on the round table, was I, I said, as, as thinking about it in global IR terms, um, let's start by trying to look at the perspective of Russia. Now that doesn't mean um, whatever Vladimir Putin says, I agree with, uh, I certainly don't, uh, but in fact, um, let's look at the historical world view. Let's look at NATO. I think NATO is a foil, by the way. I don't think NATO, I mean, NATO is a foil. But I think the NATO issue was, was, was not a real one. I think Russia is much more threatened by the idea of Europe uh, than, than, uh, than the expansion of NATO. I mean, notice the relative lack of re response relative to, uh, to both Sweden and Finland, some threats, but nothing more than that, joining NATO. But um, <clears throat> One is to put that in its place in terms of, of uh, in a sense of, and, and the worldview, the experience. Um, I've done some work actually with, uh, with colleagues at Umgimo in Moscow on looking at how international relations is taught and was taught uh, from the end of the Cold War up to the recent past in Russia, in Europe, and in North America. And in those conversations, I gained a real appreciation of just how dreadfully bad the 1990s were for our colleagues in academe in Russia. Uh, who, the only way some of them survived was external grants from US institutions and uh, they were actually sharing it collectively amongst themselves. I mean, I, I got a much greater sense of, of why that would feature prominently in, in uh, Russian sentiments and understandings. I also have a good colleague from uh, the University of Ljubljana, Petra Rocher, Rocher, who has uh, worked for the uh, Commission of Europe on looking at the discrimination against Russian minorities in the Baltic republics. So I mentioned all these issues. Now, later on, I was taken to task by one, but unfortunately, we didn't have enough time in the dialogue to have a, a real exchange of views and a dialogue about it. Um, but that, that's indicative of, of what I would say would be a global IR approach is to say, well, I'm not going to legitimize them by just mentioning them. I want to understand them, but then I want to interrogate them. I want to challenge them. I want to say, and, and my main point being, of course, invading another country is not proportional to these perceived threats or these challenges or, the, or these, these concerns historically. It doesn't mean that Russian minorities are not discriminated against both in, in Crimea, or in Crimea and Ukraine uh, and in the Baltics and in other places. Um, but I, I think it's important that that's not, a, we, we need to understand that that's not sufficient uh, justice. So just by making the move, turned out to be controversial even amongst our global IR group. So that's why we keep on having roundtables at ISA meetings to ask the question of what is global IR. But my, my opening point is to say it's multi-perspective. It's making this deliberate attempt to try to understand other views on their own terms without a sham put down or dismissive, or oh, that's not realistic, or that's not real, or that's de devoid of facts. We need to at least make that first move and then, then carry on the dialogue. And I think it has relevance to uh, that, that approach in general terms has relevance to looking at international organizations um, 
and the UN system as a whole, and and look at the the challenges that they currently face. Um, one is, I mean, we, we need to recognize that these are historically created for particular institutional purposes. They're constantly reforming and adapting, um, but they have to adapt to a world in which uh, we live in a multi-polar, multi-perspectivist world, and, and they need to accommodate um, the views of others. Uh, some institutions are better at doing that than others, but I think this is a real test to existing institutions that were created, and I'm not criticizing them, they were created and they've done very, very important things, uh, but they're operating in an increasingly complex world and need to adapt to change and create enough space so you can actually have these different perspectives introduced, taken seriously, and engaged within the fora. So I think, I think a global IR approach has lessons for international organizations and, and the UN system as a whole. So hence, join the section if you haven't joined already. Uh, I'll make that pitch and, uh, and the ISA, of course, uh, in addition. <clears throat> and, and come to our, come to our, uh, our panels at the, at the next meeting in Montreal if you're able to make it. So. Well, thank you so much, Thomas, for all of your thoughtful responses and Mark for your engaging questions and also to the audience members who ask questions as well. Um, I suspect that we will be holding more of these office hours in the future. And um, if you're interested in attending any of our other virtual events, we have a virtual events page on the ISA uh, website. So thank you again, everyone. Okay. Right. Thanks very much for organizing it. Thanks, and Mark. Thanks, thank Tom you. and Sarah for, for your organization. But Tom, that was terrific. Great thank to you. have you. All right. Thanks very much. Yep. Bye, Bye, -bye folks. <laughs>